All right, we should be live now. Welcome everybody. Welcome back from your lunchtime breaks if you're East Coast or all of your fandom meetups that happen between 12 and 1 per the schedule for the panels if you went to those. And uh, welcome to new authors in, new voices, I'm sorry, in sci-fi and fantasy for YA readers. I'm very excited to have everybody here with us today. And I do have a small little intro for you that I'm gonna read. So if I look down, excuse me. But I just wanna say welcome to the Social Distance Book Fest. I'm very excited to have all the authors here with me today and to, for you to be able to stay home and also support authors right now, as well as indie bookstores, hopefully add a couple books to your TBRs. I know I already have today. I'm Julie, I'm from Pages and Pens if you are new here and I am a booktuber who talks about the books that I read and the books that I write in my writing, editing, publishing, querying journeys. Um, Today, I'm excited to be hosting this amazing panel for new voices in YA sci-fi and fantasy. And in a moment, I'm gonna ask everybody to introduce themselves, give us their pronouns and talk about the books that they are here to discuss. Um, but in general, a brief overview of this event, we have uh, created this from a dedicated group of bookworms from all corners of the internet. It includes over 18 panels, more than 80 authors, amazing giveaways. So be sure to check out bookshop.org where you can get virtual signings and all these amazing books by these authors from fantastic indie bookshops, support them. And then all proceeds, because I believe um, Social Distance Book Fest does get 10% of the profits from the book sales. All of those profits go to COVID-19 Relief Fund. So um, please do go support your indie bookshops by checking out that link. Everything is down below for you. And we hope you take advantage of everything that we're offering because they really have put a ton of work into this book fest and we're really excited to be able to be here. So check out the playlist down below for all the panels, all the meetups. And if you miss anything today, because a lot happens at the same time, everything is going to be archived on the individual channels of the hosts like myself. So you can come back and watch this at any time. So now that that's out of the way, <laughs> if we could go through and just introduce yourself, give us your pronouns, let us know about the book that you're promoting. And we'll start with Aiden and kind of go clockwise. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> my name is Aiden Thomas. My pronouns are he, him. And I am the author of Cemetery Boys, which is newly coming out this December, September 1st. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is a paranormal urban fantasy about a trans boy who's determined to prove his gender to his traditional Latinx family. Mm -hmm. um, they're a group of Bruhex, so they can uh, see and communicate with spirits. He, Yadriel, my main character, tries to summon the spirit of his uh, dead cousin and accidentally summons the spirit of the school bad boy, and uh, hilarity and feelings ensue from there. <laughs> so, well, I, I'm sure that took her, and I just realized that I'm... Oh, no. Oh, like no. Aiden, I forgot to have my copy of Star Daughter ready to show the beautiful cover, but I am the author of Star Daughter, which is about a, um, <laughs> yeah, I see you laughing at me there, Aiden, uh, which is about a half human, half star girl who has to go on a quest to the heavenly realm to obtain a drop of healing star's blood after she accidentally injures her human father when her flame comes out. And then she finds herself uh, in all kinds of political intrigue and has to win a celestial competition to get that drop of blood. So. Um, let's see. Oh, and my pronouns are she and her, and I'm glad to be here Yay. with Yay. all of you today. Alicia, oh. uh, no, uh, let's go with Namina first, and then we'll go, we'll go a full circle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> awesome. Um, hi, guys. My name is Namina Forna. I'm sorry. Um, no worries. No worries. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, and my book is called The Gilded Ones, um, which now comes out in spring 2021, so early spring. Um, and it's set in a world, um, in an African-inspired world, where like every 16-year-old girl must go through a ritual to determine if she's pure or not. Pure is red blood, and impure is gold blood. My main character, Deka, um, discovers that her blood is gold. And because of this, um, she's given a choice, either be condemned as a demon and sentenced to death or fight on the behalf of the emperor against the monsters that are invading her kingdom. Deka goes off to fight um, and this choice um, leads her on a path to understanding the truth about girls like her and the world around her. 
Wow, that sounds, I've seen that cover around and I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> so my, uh, I'm Romina, um, she, her, and my book is Lovisona, uh, which was going to be coming out May 5th, but now alas is um, August 4th. Um, so Lovisona is about a girl named Manu, who like me comes from Argentina. Um, and she comes to Miami when she's five with her mom, but they don't have papers. And so she's grown up most of her life in hiding. Um, and so when there is an ice raid and her mom is taken, she is left alone and decides to go find out who her father was and why they ran from him and his family here. Um, and as she begins to research, she, she finds, she kind of discovers a whole magical world in the Everglades as one would. Um, and she realizes that she's not exactly human and it's not just her residency that's illegal, but her whole existence. You have, you have magic in the Everglades. I'm just gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, hi everyone. First of all, all of your books sound amazing and I can't wait to own all of them. Um, I am Alicia, she, her, um, and hello from Germany. Um, Okay, I wrote The Sound of Stars, which I have right here. <laughs> this is it. Oh, no. There, and there you go. Okay. <laughs> so, The Sound of Stars is about um, a rebel teen librarian and an alien who loves music and their road trip to possibly save humanity. Um, and it's all music and stories and it's just really like a love letter to the arts and it came out on the 25th of february but as you know that's like beginning of pandemic time so it's been rough yeah yeah well thank you for all the amazing introductions and i've got to say i know that you were probably all individually very distanced from your covers but you guys all have amazing covers. So I just kudos to your teams because all of your books look phenomenal. <laughs> Not an official question, just a random comment. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I'm going to start off with our first question. And I'm really excited for all of your answers, by the way. Thank you all for joining me today. Um, I want to start off with one that I think is very pertinent and very important. And that is that we all know how vital own voices, authors and stories are for youth right now just in general right now. And it's been said that a lot of authors write themselves into their characters and into their stories. So I'd love to know from a personal standpoint what you put of yourself um, into your books that made it uniquely own voices for yourself. And we'll start with Aiden and then I'd love to hear all of your thoughts on this. Um, there's a lot of myself <laughs> in Cemetery Boys. Uh, my main character, Yadriel, he is uh, trans, Latinx, and gay, and I am trans, Latinx, and queer. Um, and the whole magic system is built around um, Latinx magic and kind of, there's like hints of Santeria in it. Uh, and it takes place around Dia de Muertos, which is the day of the dead. So it's literally completely steeped in my own like marginalizations and bits of my identity, uh, which was really fulfilling and really exciting to do and to see people connect with those really kind of niche and specific experiences has been like incredible mm -hmm. um so yeah there's a lot of me personality wise i think i'm kind of a mix between yadriel and julian because i can be like logical and kind of chill but i can also just be like bonkers like hyperactive and like all over the place <laughs> and unable to focus <laughs> Shweta, do you want to go next? Sure. Wonderful. Well, I mean, I when I decided to start doing writing seriously, I wanted to do what I think we're all doing here, which is write the stories we didn't get, right? And so I absolutely, there's so much of me in, in everything I write, whether it's the Hindu mythology, the, you know, Desi characters, or, or like even like Star Daughter opens with the scene where where the where the main character Sheetal is at a family party and you know and I totally had to drag the whole aunties and aunt, uncles who are always like ah so what's your major and you know and because this totally happened to me that I remember when I was when I was in college we were at a family party and so same thing so what's your major and I said German and they and everyone would look at me and they'd be like 
no, what's your major? You know, because <laughs> it was supposed to be like, you know, doctor, you know, medicine, uh, law, whatever, something practical. And, you know, so definitely uh, I wanted to poke a little fun at that, but also kind of celebrate it because it's what I know. And, and I think, uh, I, I think honestly that it's really cool that we now are getting a chance to share all our experiences and our backgrounds with other people because that's so cool. So. <laughs> Am I next? Am I next? Yes, you are. <laughs> um, so the Gilded Once um, is based um, on my experiences growing up in Sierra Leone. Um, so I grew up during the Civil War, um, which lasted a decade. And while I thankfully evaded most of it, like just that sort of feeling of pressure and oppression was what I wanted to put into this book. The other thing is like, um, Sierra Leone is extremely patriarchal, um, but also so is the United States. I think like I was watching, I, well, I tried to watch Tiger King and I was like, whoa, there's a lot of that in this. Um, so I tried to examine all of that throughout the Gilded Ones. Um, finally, like I'm of the Timney tribe from Sierra Leone. And so a lot of the words and like concepts that I use are basically Tim main origin. And I just, I thought it was so fun because like Sierra Leonean people will like read this book and laugh because a lot of the words are wor words that we actually use. And um, I just think that they will be like, wow, we see a lot of this of us in this. Yes, um, so um, I love that. I, uh, I feel like I covered a little bit about the fact of being from Argentina and everything. I think the bigger point for me though, wasn't so much of like, you have to be an Argentine immigrant to connect more so the immigrant identity and what does it mean? And is it a label or is it a state of being, you know? And I feel like it's this thing I've grappled with my whole life. I've always felt out of place. I've always had anxiety as a result of a lot of, you know, since the move. Um, and I think I just wanted to explore this idea of coming from two worlds, but belonging to none. Um, speaking two languages, but still lacking the words to define yourself, like searching all these languages for a label and realizing I've been trying on and discarding labels my whole life and they're doing nothing for me. You know, what at what point did we stop defining words and did they start defining us, you know? Um, and I just, that's the stuff I get very passionate about, as you can tell. And so I poured all of that into this, you know, cause this idea, it's a very binary system, the, the septimus, which are the creatures of, of my, my books. And it's like the, you know, if you're born, uh, if you're, uh, uh, the daughters become brujas and the sons become lobisones or werewolves and that's it. And there's no in between. So you're sort of trapped, you're literally trapped in your body. Like there is no escaping and it's horrible, you know, and it makes you explore like, why do we ascribe certain traits to femininity, masculinity? Like, what are these words? Why are we defined so much by by things that are so beyond our control? Like where in this world we popped out in, what we look like, all of these things, you know, our reproductive organs, whatever. And um, and I think that's really what I poured into this. And I just wanted to make a comment on own voices, right? Because this is what I think is so great about own voices. I am not speaking for all Argentines. I'm not speaking for all immigrants. What's amazing about own voices is that you, in the personal, you get the universal. And the more personal it is, the more universal it's going to feel. And the beauty of celebrating own voices is that, that we're celebrating that specific perspective and we're not reducing it or minimalizing it just because it happens to come from a brain that you know belongs to someone that looks different or is normally marginalized or doesn't come from the same place you come from or speaks a different language i'll get off my soapbox but that's <laughs> all <laughs> i agree i agree um for me the the sound of stars um features a fat black queer uh, chronically ill <laughs> um, uh, girl pr protagonist, and um, that's who I am. So I think that's hey. Um, I wrote that in there, but we may share different mar the same marginalizations and, and identities. But I'm not that character. Um, whereas you know, it, and I think that's that was really fun writing it and having and sharing those things with with a character, but also just like knowing that that's not you and that that's the, it makes it more universal in that way. Um, 
I mean, I, and I wrote the other character, which is a, um, a demi alien boy. So and that was fun. Who I also, I think my personality kind of goes more toward him than, than Ellie. Um, and that's also really fun. But when it comes to own voices, it's, you, there's a fine line. Um, when it when when it comes to writing, you know, black stories, and I'm black, and I don't want to mess up. I don't want anybody to go, well, that's not my experience, and I don't want to write about sexuality in a way that's like, oh, that's not right either. So you just kind of have to balance that line a lot, and it at some point you know you're going to get uh, you know critique on, well, this isn't what I experienced, so it's not right, um, and it's. It's scary and it's hard to do, and I think you just have to go ahead and do it. And you know that there are going to be people who read it and are going to relate to it and are going to hold it close to their hearts, and it's going to inspire them. And I hope for that all the time, and I think that everyone up here is just awesome. And you guys are all so – you're all amazing and brave, and, and I can't wait to read all of your books. That's all. I would like to, I would like to clap for that one. I agree. Um, I'm very, very excited um, about all of the stories that, that you're telling. Um, and I'm actually, because you talked about your Demi alien, I would like to jump in my list of questions a little bit and discuss your favorite supporting character in your story. I feel like we always get, um, you know, news or information about your main characters when you guys talk about your books, but I would love to know your little like niche corner, you know, supporting character, maybe somebody that doesn't show up that much, but you just really, really loved that you want your readers to just kind of like keep an eye out for because they really mean something to you. So I'd love to know that. Uh, Shveta, do you want to start with that one? I'm jumping Aiden. We'll come back. Sure. To you um, I'm, I'm, and I'm laughing because I automatically know who mine is. Uh, she's Bill's best friend, Minnell. She's, she's, I, I really wanted to write about uh, uh, friendship, female friendship. And not have it be, you know, a bad thing, or not have them be at each other's throats. Have them have each other's backs, and the and so, you know, um, Minnell is just because you know she feels like the the star who's hidden, right? Only Minnell and her and she feels very close family know the truth about her, but but Minnell does, and so she, you know, she's very wry and and very blunt, and she will, you know, she'll like for when she still has to dye her hair because it starts to show silver, her silver roots. You know, she's like, are you sure it's okay? And Minnell will say things like, it's still as black as a politician's heart, just like it was five minutes ago, you know? And, and uh, you know, I, so yeah, I just, I really like her and I, I wish you were real, but. Oh. <laughs> I love that. Namina, do you want to go next? Sure. We'll still cycle through. <laughs> also, if you guys see me moving around, like there's like a spider, like literally. No. <laughs> I don't know what to do, y'all. I don't know what to do. <laughs> but it's moving away. Okay. I know. All right. Um, so my favorite character, um, my favorite supporting character, her name is Britta. She is my main character. She's my protagonist, Vega's best friend. And Britta is amazing because, you know, she is like this um, girly girl who's totally into boys. And the first thing she asks, asks Vega is, oh, have you ever, like, have you ever been kissed before? What was it like? She's like that type of person, the person who, like, is just warm and bubbly and, like, asks questions that you're like, wait, what? But, like, you are okay with it because she's just that person. But Britta is also massively strong. Like that's her thing, her power. And like, if you mess with Deka, if you mess with anybody that she loves, this girl would like will like literally throw you through a wall and she'll do it smiling the whole time. She'll be like, and now you should learn better. I hope you've learned. She's like that type of person. And that's why I love her so much because She's that one friend who I think everybody deserves a friend like Britta, the type of person who has your back 100%, who is there to like support you um, and who takes no mess, even though she is smiling and happy and girly and cheerful, she is literally a person who will put you through a wall. And that's what I love so much about her. I love that. I love it because I'm also going to say the best friend. Um, so my favorite in Lobisona is uh, her name is Saisa. And funny story, I actually named her after a reader I met in Spain. Um, and like, she literally was like, I don't believe you're going to do it. And I was like, 
I'm sorry, what? Like, you never <laughs> tell me what you think I will or won't do. And I was like, you're going to be such an important character in the next book I write. And she's like, okay. So imagine her surprise when I went back years, years of Twitter posts through all these weird hashtags I've ever posted to find, I remembered her clever response once to something, to find her thing, to finally message her and be like, look, look, I'm doing it. I kept my, I think she thought I was crazy, um, right. but she's like, I can't believe you really used my name. I'm like, not only did I use your name, okay? Let me tell you, she is my favorite. Sai says this, um, She's this spunky little bruja who like doesn't like she just does not care for rules. Rules are not ma made for her. Um, and she has Manu's back, you know, the whole time. And she has some of my favorite lines. And one of them I really want on a bumper sticker. Like she tells Manu, um, go forth and shatter every convention. <laughs> and like then the publisher put it on a pin for me. And I'm like, I'm going to go to every conference wearing that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I also have a, uh, a best friend. Um, her name is Alice. She is easily distracted. She is just kind of bubbly and like is just all over the place and it just really is about enjoying the life you have while you have it. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed writing her as a, and she's like not in the whole story, but she's there and every time she, she shows up, she's kind of brightens in a scene, you know? Um, and I really enjoyed that, so. That's my supporting character. Uh, for me, it's also a best, the best friend <laughs> slash cousin. Um, so Yadriel's best friend slash cousin is uh, Maritza. And she is, she's the one that I think I get the most messages about from like early readers about how much they love her. She is um, very strong, very confident and has kind of been Yadriel's hype person his entire journey through his transition and kind of figuring out his gender, um, like without even blinking. She is there for him, it supports him and like lets him kind of lead her and like how he wants to be treated and stuff like that. Um, and she is also one of those people who will literally do anything um, to protect the people that she cares about. And she's, she's awesome. She has these two huge pet pit bulls um, that are rather <laughs> a large part of the story. Um, and she's great. I love her so much. She's <laughs> definitely one of the most fun characters to write in the whole series, uh, series whole book. <laughs> <laughs> Spoilers. Um, <laughs> that they all sound amazing. And I, I, I regretfully have only read Lobizana because I would like to read them all, but I gotta say they all sound fantastic. Um, and coming from a place of support and, you know, building one another up, I'd love to talk to you guys about your, like, experience and your favorite thing about the, specifically the YA readership and community. Um, I think that you guys, you know, obviously wrote in YA for a reason. So what's your, your favorite thing about this specific audience that's maybe watching right now, just kind of, and like the readership right now for YA? Do you want to start, Namina? And we'll go, we'll, we'll circle through. <laughs> oh my gosh, circling for me. Oh. Um, I love the YA community because I think that YA, like YA readers just have their fingers on the pulse of everything. And they are so incisive and so like, they, like they're so incisive. They're so sort of um, communicative. Like that's the thing I love is that if a YA reader loves something, they'll let you know and they'll reach out and it really makes you feel like you're part of the community. You know what I mean? Like it creates a community for you. Um, I obviously can't speak to other communities, but I just, I think that's been my favorite part is interacting with the readers, seeing like, like having them reach out and be like, Hey, like I love this or whatever, or more importantly, like talking with readers about like issues and stuff that comes up in the book, because a lot of times I will not have seen or noticed or even thought of something and somebody will bring it up. And I'll be like, hmm, I never thought of that before. Like, let me go back and circle and like work on it and build it and come back. And that to me has just been the most joyful part of it. It's just that 
the reaching out aspect to the being in communication aspect is just, it's great. Like I have been for so long, so used to like writing in a bubble where it's just me and like a few people being like, read my book. Like, you know, like I promise you it'll be good. I promise you. And now like there's people like reaching out and actually engaging. And like, not only that, like actually being like, Hey, have you thought about this? No, I haven't, but it's great. I'll think about it now. Like that is the best. That is the absolute best. I love that. Yeah. I agree with that. You know, I love talking to YA readers. Um, I, I love being challenged by YA readers. Like I love, you know, engaging. Um, I think what's interesting about YA is it's this like genreless genre, right? Like it's really an umbrella term for a bunch of different type of stories. What unites these stories is not really the age of the protagonist because there's many adult stories with young protagonists. What changes it is you're constantly in dialogue with your reader. That's what YA is. You're not writing in a vacuum the way maybe a literary adult, you know, whatever commercial adult that might be, like who they're thinking of something else. You're literally talking to that reader and saying, all right, you know, like, is, how is this feeling? Like, is this accurate? Is it, you know, and, and, and it's the whole time you're keeping them in mind. The moment you forget them, it shows. You know, um, and I think that's the parts that we struggle with more. The scenes that we have a harder time centering in that and, and addressing and having that conversation. And that's why it's so important to do these kinds of events, to do school events, to go, you know, to talk at libraries, to like really interact, you know, with social media, whatever it is um, with readers, because we are writing for them. We don't get to be above our reader, especially in this genre, you know, um, and the moment we forget them, I think they're very unforgiving as well, you know, um, and they, they're not going to stand for BS. You know, they have enough of it in their lives. So um, I think that's cool. It keeps you on your toes and it's fun. It's just fun. Could I add, um, I think the other best thing about YA readers is that they're not a monolith. Like it's not just teens that read our book. It's like everybody, you know, so like you can literally be talking to somebody who's 70 years old and a YA reader. And I just, I think that that is beyond amazing. Sorry, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, I was, I spent most of my youth at the town library. That's where I really felt like I was okay and everything was fine for me and the safest. Um, and I fell in love with YA books really early. Um, and I, a lot of mysteries, everything I could find, I inhaled. Um, Later on, I got my first job at the library, um, working there, and I, it was one of the only teens. And then years later, I got my master's in library science so that I could be a YA a librarian. And I worked with a lot of teens and um, middle grade, I would say. Um, and they love talking about books. They love sharing what they love about books. They love, it's just a constant, it is constant communication about it. Um, but one of the reasons I love writing YA is it's all of those things, but it's because they are, they are the, they have their finger on the pulse. Yes. But they're also the fighters. I feel like teens today, especially they're, they're fighting for their future and they want to read books that are constantly talking about what they're doing and how they may feel. Um, and the pressure that that, that that entails. So I wanted to, when I wrote why I always wanted to talk about issues that they may be experiencing, but also giving them hope that it's, you can still keep fighting and it is going to be a tough battle, but there's always gonna be hope to be found. Um, so that was why I always really loved wanting to write um, YA and why I always loved working within the library of NYA and working with teens because they they inspire me and um, they it's just such a great age group and again I just I love I love writing for them it's just I hope that they enjoy it I don't know <laughs> yeah, I I totally agree with all of that <laughs> um, for me like specifically with writing Cemetery Boys I wanted to give kids who are trans Latinx queer a story where there's like Alicia said hope um, but we're also with their 
seeing themselves as being powerful and having control over their situation and being able to be themselves and the fact that parts, inherent parts of who they are, are very powerful and very important. Um, so I wanted a book where there is a, you know, trans Latinx uh, boy who is like conquering all of this, who knows exactly who he is. It's the rest of the world that hasn't figured it out yet. Um, and so that's really important. Every time I get like a reader who reaches out to me and is like, hey, like this like meant so much to me, um, like to finally be able to see myself in books because there's not a lot of rep that I have in Cemetery Boys that kind of exists in media in general, not just stories. And that's like so important to me. And like every time I see a young reader, like with one of my arcs, I like, I get a little bit more powerful each time. <laughs> beautiful i'm loving all these answers <laughs> and you know i'll just add that one thing that you know i i was bullied so much as a teenager that i didn't want to i just didn't want to be anymore and i just love the thought that we get to reach people i mean sure adults like you were saying i mean i read too but for our target reader leadership right that we get to reach people who are just starting to figure out what they feel about the world, what they feel about themselves and other people. And they're, so they're still pretty plastic and we can, you know, we can, it's a chance not only like all of you were saying to let them see that they do have power, but also to think about how what they do affects others, you know, and to, so that they, because not us, they are going to be the ones who take the world where it goes next. Yeah. And, you know, and call me, you know, you know, call me idealistic and ridiculous, but I, you know, in my heart is the dream that one day we will all understand how we are all in interconnected and how we need to live from a place that honors that and honors one another and celebrates everything that we are instead of trying to destroy it. So if, you know, if we reach even just one person that way through a story, that's amazing. Well, um, now that I'm teary, uh, that, that was genuinely um, from a reader standpoint that that you know discusses books and it tries to have their finger on the pulse and discuss on BookTube and is a part of the active BookTube community. It's wonderful to hear authors that um, that that's one of the reasons why they want it to write within a specific genre is because of how involved a book community is. So thank you from our behalf to you. Um, because that's that's beautiful. I'm gonna jump into a little bit more of like the craft, a couple craft questions. Um, specifically, I would love to know what came first for you as we discuss all the themes and um, characters that you have in your books. So did the first thing that came to you when you started to write your novel, was it the plot? Did you know which kind of issues you wanted to tackle? Was it a character that kind of came alive for you and then you wrote? What did your uh, beginning writing process look like? Alicia, we'll start with you. Okay. <laughs> Romina got bumped. <laughs> well, I'm kind of, sometimes I'll just be thinking about stuff and I'll take a walk and you know, whatever strikes me. And then suddenly like I had this idea, oh, a teen le a rebel librarian, that could be really fun. And then I just sat down and I wrote three chapters and I was like, oh, I guess I could outline this. And then I outlined it and then I wrote the book and I it was all one month and it was done. I revised and then it just kind of fell into place like that. Sometimes it's like that. Other times it's not. <laughs> Other times it's like, you know, the character comes first. Usually for me, the character always comes first um, and everything else kind of falls into place. And what I want to talk about or, or what I want to like and enjoy like for the next book, like the sound of stars fell together really easily. The other book I'm writing is a foodie fantasy where it was like, I knew what I wanted to do and I knew I wanted to write about food and now I'm going to do it. <laughs> and that's that. So for me, it's usually characters and it's a theme that comes first. Now it's you Romina. 
<laughs> oh, I thought when you said I got bumped, I thought I was no, going no, no. Last. You just Sorry. got bumped. <laughs> you you just didn't get to start that one. We're not I kicking you out. Bomb I'm last. We're not kicking you that. out. No, no, you're good. <laughs> I'm just so used to being last. Okay. Um. So, um, I typically begin with world. Um. So. What, there's um, a line that Alan Watts said, something he said that is, um, we're not born into this world, we're born from it. Um, and so I really, really think that for me to truly center a character in another world and not make them kind of some variety of me or you know whatnot, I really need to know what, what the world is that they're born into, be it a different point in time on earth or be it its own complete setting. you know what is the topography? What is the history of it? What is its big bang? You know, what, what, what is, what happened? What is the governance? What are the beliefs? What are like every, I need to know everything that led to the moment of conception of this uh, character pretty much. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm also the author I forgot to mention of the Zodiac series. So I am a big time Virgo for anyone who's familiar with astrology, which means we're neurotic. Yes, thank you. <laughs> we're very neurotic. We like our details. We are obsessive. Um, we don't let anything get past. We're very perfectionist and we can, ju we can lose our minds on a detail. Oh God, I'm sorry, by the way, if I get kicked off, there's a big storm here right now. Oh, no. <laughs> like the internet is like flickering. Um, and so, um, so that's kind of how I big, and, and so, Long story short, I, 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 I go from there. <laughs> Sorry, I'm worried it's gonna cut me off. <laughs> oh. um, for me, it always kind of starts with a random idea. Um, for Cemetery Boys, Cemetery Boys is actually my option book. It's not the first book I sold, mm. um, but my publisher decided that it should be my debut, which I absolutely agree with. Um, and kind of the funny part of that is when it came time to start pitching my editor ideas for my option book. I, uh, I have a Tumblr and I follow a lot of writing prompt blogs and a prompt popped up. It, it was literally just what would happen if you summoned a ghost and you couldn't get rid of it. And I was like, what would happen if I summoned a ghost and I couldn't get rid of it? And that's kind of where the basis for Cemetery Boys was. And then Yadriel was obviously the next part. Um, but it was interesting because when I brought this when I was thinking about this project, I was talking to my agent who was not my agent at the time. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm thinking about like uh, this kid and like blah, 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 uh, ghosts and stuff. And she was like, you know, you could like, you could write about like brown people and like queer people. And I was like, I is that allowed? I was like, are you sure? I was like, because I genuinely felt that I wasn't, I wouldn't be able to sell a book that had a Latinx character or a queer character or a trans character, let alone all three. And I was like, there's no way. So I like went to pitch these ideas to my editor. Um, Cemetery Boys was the shortest pitch and it was full of question marks because I was like, well, I, I mean, and then this could happen. I mean, maybe JK, unless maybe um <laughs> it was a series of kind of me asking permission to write the story but with this character that has these marginalizations um and my editor like immediately was just like yes that's the story i want give me that one and i was like really <laughs> um so that was yeah that was a really interesting process just kind of getting the whole idea together is that i thought it turned into something that i never thought i'd be allowed to write All right. Did... My turn? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I, I tend to start with ideas too. And because I'm a very visual person and, but I can tell you exactly what the inspiration for Star Daughter was because I read the illustrated version of Neil Gaiman's Stardust many years ago. I think it was like 2001 or 2002. I found it in an indie bookstore in New York City. I was like, oh, this looks really cool and, and bought it. And it was illustrated by Charles Vest. And, you know, and I just loved it. And then years later when the movie version came out, I watched it and I started thinking, you know, this would be really cool to have, to like redo as with a girl whose mom, I was thinking of a short story though, with a mom who's, uh, or a girl whose mom was from, a uh, star from a Hindu constellation. And then the more I started thinking about it, I was like, oh no, there's going to have to be a quest. And I guess if there's a quest, there's got, got to be a novel. But 
but yeah, so that, that was fun. And it's, you know, it's, I, I, it's not a retelling, but it's just, it's neat to be able to point right at it and be like, that was my inspiration. And now it's its own thing. Um, so with the Gilded Ones, it started as most of my books do with a dream. Um, I was in college at Spelman College, and I would have this recurring dream of this girl. She's walking slow motion in golden armor. Um, she's like on a hill, and below her, there's this massive battle that's going on, like people are fighting. And so she jumps up slow motion, sword in hand, and the dream cuts out. And I don't know what happens. Um, and like that dream sort of stuck with me throughout my college years because college was like a really tough time for me. Um, I had not sort of processed the trauma of growing up like where I did. Um, and I really felt that I need, I, I really needed someone to rescue me. Like that was what I felt deep in my heart. But then as I thought about this, because this is something that like slowly unfurled, I realized, well, why can't I rescue myself? And so like, that's how the Gilded Ones came out was, I was having all these questions about what does it mean to be a woman? Like, how are you punished for being a woman? Like, and in finding the character of Deka and having this dream of this girl, I was like, oh, okay, so this is a way that I can talk about the things that were painful for me and my family in a way that people will understand. Because like typically when you talk about like growing up in a war, people don't have that emotional space um, or like I don't think people can imagine it. And so to like bring it to the abstract um, and show like what it means to be a teenage girl in a time of difficulty like really that's what the gilded ones is there's a reason why in my book girls bleed gold it's because you know women are commodified and monetized and i wanted to talk about all those things but in a way i wanted to process my trauma and help other girls process their trauma in a way that was i guess easier because with fact fantasy there's a distance and that distance allows you to to think about things that would perhaps be too difficult for you to think about if it was real and so that's how the gilded one started out beautiful beautiful answer and and also incredibly poignant and true um, I'm gonna jump directly to our Instagram and uh, reader submitted questions because they were beautiful and we're quickly chatting out of time. So I wanna make sure that we get to some of theirs and that they're uh, represented here in some of the questions. So one of the first questions is a YA must read for you. So is there a book within the YA genre that you just like absolutely love and want to have more people read besides your own, which is obvious and please go to the bookshop.org. The link is down below, go support Indie bookstores and the authors on the panel. But other than that, we'll start with Romina. <laughs> Wait, did you say a, a book or genre? What a, a book within YA that you recommend that's a must read for you. Oh, okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm just gonna, um, so I, um, I have so many. <laughs> and now I feel on this, but I'm like, oh no, I'm sorry. So many people I need to promote. Ah, what do I do? All right. So I'm going to say Diamond City by Francesca Flores. It's an awesome fantasy um, set in this like brutal, brutal uh, fantasy city. Um, and she is an incredible assassin. So we know assassins are awesome to follow in YA. Um, not any other genre I wouldn't recommend as much. Um, but it's awesome. It's colorful. It's exciting. She's tough. Um, and yeah, and I, I'm having a great time and, and I believe it's a series. Awesome. Um, I feel like I've been shouting about this book a lot, but it, I love it. So I'm going to keep shouting about it. Um, Undead Girl Gang by Lily Anderson. It's so good. <laughs> um, it's about a, a girl who try, who brings back her best friend who was murdered but ends up 
also bringing back like the other like girl bullies, like the mean girls. And it turns into a case of trying to figure out um, what happened to them before time runs out. And it is, it's really incredible and super fun. Um, I will say when the moon was ours by Anna Marie McLemore, uh, that book is just beautiful and and full of gorgeous imagery and amazing characters. And also Anna Marie's just the best. So. Can I have multiples? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. All the rest. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay. So A Song of Rates and Ruin by Rosie Brown. Um, Ray Bearer, Jordan Ifueko, um, The Bells, Danielle Clayton, which by the like, so the first two are not out yet. Luckily, you know, I have them. I'm <laughs> very gleeful about that. Um, but <laughs> The Bells is already out. And like, I love teacup animals. I love, like, have you guys read The Bells? So there are tiny animals that you can, like, that are small enough to fit in teacups. So you can have like a teacup elephant or whatever. And so these are just like books that are bringing me so much joy right now. And I would highly recommend them. Okay, I'm gonna go really fast. It's like, whew, really fast. Um, okay, so uh, Crown Chasers by Rebecca Coffin-Daffer, amazing. Um, oh no, <sighs> Laura Beth Johnson wrote one that I, the name is fuzzy in my brain right now and it is so good and you have to have it. Oh man, somebody look that up real fast. Okay, and also, um, oh, I really wanna read A Song Below Water by Bethany C. Morrow. And I really, really wanna read Legendborn by um, Tracy Dion and Sheena Bookweg's Glitch Kingdom. And hold on, hold on, hold on, I have so many. I really like the Honor Bound series, like the whole the whole thing. I really enjoy those a lot. Oh, Tweet Cute by Emma Lord. Super cute. Um, oh, uh, what I like about you, Marissa Cantor. And oh no, if there's just too many. There's too many. I can't do anymore. I, can't do anymore. I have too many. It's too many. That's okay. I get <laughs> it. I'll write a list every watching. Everybody is like frantically writing down in like a notebook right now. <laughs> this is archive, guys. You can come back and you can get them all, I promise. Um, so we have a lot more questions from our fans and they're going to be just, we're going to spring them on you because you guys haven't, you don't know them, but Aiden, you're going to be first. We want to know, um, how is the hair pulling process of writing your second book going? But this is your option book. So you've probably already written your second one. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so <laughs> I wrote my first book first, which is Lost in the Neverwoods, which is a dark reimagining of the Peter Pan fairy tale. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I love that. It's really good and I love it. Um, but so Cemetery Boys was basically my second book process. So I can talk about that, which was a bit bananas. I wrote the first draft of Cemetery Boys in six weeks. It had to be fast drafted in order for us to meet deadlines so that it could come out in June, <laughs> and now it's coming out in September. Um, it was really difficult. Those six weeks nearly killed me. Um, but I am a hardcore plotter, so I have a full plot of my book, and then I have a more detailed plot outline, and then I actually then plot out each chapter before I write it. And that's literally the only way I would have been able to fast draft it so quickly is because I knew exactly which step was coming up next and all the beats I needed to hit. Otherwise, it, it would have been impossible. And it was really, really difficult all of a sudden working under deadlines um, to get like a draft written. Um, so yeah, that was, it was pretty bananas. <laughs> well, kudos and well done. That's amazing. I wish I could do that. Um, I am, yeah, I'm in the throes of book two and, and I can't say anything about it yet because it hasn't been announced, but it's hard. It's really hard. <laughs> you know, I had lots of years to draft and rewrite and redraft and revise Star Daughter, whereas it's like, oh, here, get a, you know, get it up to speed in, in less than a year. And, and so, yeah, it, it's a challenge, but I, I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm in the second draft right now, so wish me luck. Good luck. You Good can luck. do it. 
I am so glad that you said I can't talk so much about it because I was going to spill some details about book two. And then I was like, wait a second, no, I can't do that. Um, I am currently working on book two and I can't deny it is such a struggle. Like usually I think the biggest struggle is that like coronavirus has like upended everything. And like, I'm a person of routine. Like typically like I wake up every morning and I write 10 pages per day. So like I can tell you like on a given day, I'd be like, okay, I can finish this then because that's just like how my routine is. I wake up early, I, but like with, you, you cannot, like I'm not waking up the same times, like I'm having funky dreams, which I know everybody is. Like, it's just, it's, it's really, really <laughs> difficult to write under that sort of thing. But then the other thing that complicates this is that, um, my book two deals a lot with grief. Like um, last year I had a lot of grief in the family um, and uh, I, I did not realize how much that would impact writing book two because there's like sort of like really important characters that die and my main character has to deal with that. And so every time I write it, like I then, I then have to reprocess my grief from last year. And it is not fun because mm -hmm. like what will happen is like, I'll write and then I'll cry. And then I, I'm like, okay, I'm done for the day, hands off. Like it's, it's a wrap. And then it'll take me like sort of a lot to like sit down again because it's like you're ripping off that sort of wound. So that has not been fun. One thing that has been very helpful and I recommend this for everyone is outlines. Like I know outlines are painful and awful and whatever to write. But like really outline save your day because like they keep you on track. Like what I will like what I literally do is I paste bits of my outline, like whatever part of the outline or arc of the story I'll be working on into um, the actual draft. Yes, I see you, Aiden. And like as I write, like it's like a thing, like, yes, I can tick off this part of the outline, tick off this part of the outline. Mm -hmm. And then if I'm having a problem with the story. Um, that's like sort of like a massive one, like the story isn't working. I'm like, okay, that means I need to go back to outline and re-examine this because this is a structural problem. So then I'll like pull back and like read through the outline again and rewrite the outline again until like, I feel like I have that structure correct and then I go back in. So long story short, outline saved the day. COVID, coronavirus is awful. Everybody good luck. Um, for me, I don't, I don't have another book deal right now to discuss. So all I can say is that I have written since the sound of stars, I've written maybe four books and we'll see what happens with that. Um, they're all like one is a foodie fantasy. Another is a sci-fi dystopian and another is a sci-fi rom-com, which is really ridiculous. So We'll see. But also, before I go, I wanted to say another book. <laughs> the the Henna Wars by Ariba uh, Jagadir is incredible. Holy crap. You got to get it. Get on that. Yep. Okay, that's all. <laughs> oh, my God. Now I want to just run down a bunch. But okay. Um, so for me, it's a little different because I'm actually working on the sequel right now to Lobisona which was due March 1st, but like I also was having a hard time writing during all of this. And I'm also a person of routine, like everything, like I, that resonates so much with me. I outline, I, you know, every, but this thing came and totally, it made it so hard. And it reminded me of the 2016 election when I was on deadline with the last, the fourth and final book in the Zodiac series. I we grieved that election like it was the death of a loved one and I could not write and I could not function and that was the last time I felt this that I just like my creative was blocked but I can say something to writing my sophomore series um so writing a second series has been like you know it's been really um it's paved with self-doubt you know because you do wonder you're like okay you know, my like I can say I've published more than one book, but really the subsequent books are part of that one book. So how do I not know it was just like, oh, one hit wonder like you, you got a book published, you had a couple of readers, good for you, you know, like now what's next in your life, you know? So like you do, you wonder like, do I have what it's what it takes to like keep at this, do it again. Um, I, um, I try to get published for like eight and a half years, 
Um, I wrote five books and all of them were rejected. So it took a long time and a lot of perseverance. And I know a lot of people have those stories, but sometimes we just hear the big first deal stuff and we get it in our heads that we have to like make it with the first book or we can't, you know, and we start hearing all those rejections in our worst moments and we have a reel of them to play out, you know, so like it really feels real. But um, but yeah, you just have to keep at it and you have to remember how much you love this particular story and try to try to center yourself as much as you can in it. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely a surreal experience, but it's awesome. You know, I, I definitely, I feel like we agree, I wouldn't trade this for anything. Well, it gives me a lot of hope because I'm still querying and writing, so I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> we, You guys have covered so many of the like subsequent little like sub questions in your answers already. So we're just gonna wrap up with one last one. And that is essentially uh, the readers wanna know and your like fans and the community wants to know how best to support you. And one of the fan questions that we got was um, what's so hard about being a, a new author right now, specifically with everything that's happening, missing out on signings, uh, not being able to tour and do different things, do cons. Um, and the fear of not being able to reach as many readers. Um, and that's a couple of the questions that we got actually from submissions was basically um, how you're feeling right now and how we can best support you. I will mention again, that shop link is down below. Please go use it, support all the authors. But then I'd love to just uh, kind of end with your thoughts. How are you? How can we support you? Because we all want to. Uh, Aiden, we'll just start with you again. We'll circle back. Um. Yeah, everything that's going on has been a total bummer. Um, Cause I, for me in writing this book, it's really important for me to connect with on a, like a really personal level with readers um, and kind of not having those opportunities um, to see folks face to face has been probably the most disappointing part, honestly. Um, like the professional stuff is really cool too, but honestly just being able to meet readers was like any of um, you could ask any of my friends and they'll tell you the only thing that Aiden cares about is connecting with readers. Like Aiden mm -hmm. doesn't care about the other stuff <laughs> much to the frustration of people on my team. Sometimes I think, um, uh, but the best way to support me right now and to support, especially like debut authors um, is pre-orders. Pre-orders are really important. And if you're planning on buying the book, anyways, when it comes out, doing a pre-order makes a huge difference. Um, and that being said, I have a pre-order campaign going on for Cemetery Boys. You can find out about it on my website, which is aiden-thomas.com or on my Twitter. And uh, for every pre-order, um, including international, you get five character cards who who, which were designed by uh, Mars Ladderbaugh, who is my cover artist. Um, so you get the five character cards, you get a signed book plate, and then 50 randomly selected um, submissions for with the United States address will be entered to win a, uh, a Cemetery Boys limited edition enamel pin, which is also designed by Mars Ladderbaugh. So there's a bunch of free stuff that I would really like to give you <laughs> if you do your pre-order. Um, and my local indie is Powell's Books in Portland. So if you happen to do it through there, that's even more incredible. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, I think that's a really sweet question. So whoever sent it, thank you for, you know, wanting to help. And I mean, obviously, I hope my book sounds interesting to you and that you would like to read it. And if you do, then like Aiden said, pre-orders are great. But also, if you can, just keep requesting and ordering people's books. I mean, I think the main thing right now, especially during all of this, is the uncertainty for authors' careers in general, especially debuts. You know, we were counting on certain things to happen that aren't happening now, and that will affect sales in a way that, you know, may not be good for the future and us continuing to have careers. So please, if you can, please help by just ordering books, requesting them at your library, you know, using independent bookstores, uh, getting gift certificates for other people maybe who can't afford books right now like whatever you feel you can do you know that that would warm my heart i can tell you that and i i want us to be able to continue making stories for you and yeah so if you can help that that way that would be amazing thank you 
I would echo everything that everybody has said. For me, like it would be amazing if you could request it at your library. Um, when I was a kid, like I was a library person and there is nothing more magical to me than like seeing my books in libraries and maybe even going to one day sneak in and like sign them. Um, honestly, when I found out my book was pushed, that was devastating. I have wanted, all I've ever wanted in my life is to be an author. And I was so looking forward to like meeting with fans and like, you know, like just seeing the fact that people read my book. But I, I know that like, this is for the best. Like I, I am so lucky to be here, like, in Georgia surrounded by my family, you know, to still have books to work on. And like, I don't know what the silver lining is, honestly, but I'm gonna find it. And I think like right now, the silver lining is being here and being surrounded by family. Um, the other thing that you guys can do is like, follow me on Twitter. I'm on Twitter at Navina Forna um, and also on Instagram, but I'm mainly on Twitter. Like if you follow me on Twitter, I'll talk back. <laughs> um, for me, I, my book came out February 25th. Um, I live in Germany, so I flew over the week after. And um, all of my events were canceled. So, oh, hi. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> oh, hi. Oh, no. All of my, um, all of my events were canceled. Um, and then I got trapped in the country for a little bit and my flights were canceled to go back to Germany and they were saying I might not and it was a whole thing but I did get to stop in one more page book in Virginia and I got to like sign my name to a few of the books and that was like the best I could hope for um otherwise it's been extremely um disappointing and and I know that that um we're all feeling it we're all going through it so um it was a lot it was a, a really a really a lot and it was extremely sad for me um that said the best way to support um, authors like me and all of us up here, um, pre-orders for the books that haven't been released yet for, for me, please request, please um, please buy from independent uh, bookstores, um, like One More Page in Virginia, who I love. And um, yeah, just any way you can at this point. I mean, if you, and if you loved it, please feel free to shout about it. That's always really helpful and review it on all the, the sites and stuff. Um, anything helps, really anything helps. I, I've been like trying to do my best, but it's, you know, it's really hard. Um, and also before I go again, Goddess in the Machine by Laura Beth Johnson, it came back in my brain and that's a book you have to pre-order and it's gonna it's gonna blow your mind. It's amazing. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, everything's been said, like pre-orders help us, requesting from your library helps us. Just adding the book to your Goodreads shelf helps us. Um, mm -hmm. Rating and reviewing if you liked it, sh posting on your social, just I like this book or I'm interested in reading this book. Anything you could do at any level is going to help us because right now we feel like we've just been put on mute like we were talking and shouting so loud about our stuff and then someone zapped us now we're like <laughs> and so it's like anything you can do and i do have a pre-order um campaign going on my local um bookstore is books and books and, and so anything pre-ordered from there i will personalize um and you can find it through through bookshop and through all these and then the the if you want to enter the pre-order giveaway um, which you can find everything at my Instagram, which is just Romina Garber in the link. I've got these pins um, that are like little like things. Oh, oh, the one I mentioned before, shatter every convention. <laughs> and then there's a line that's, why be a son of the system when you can mother a movement? And so we've got mother a movement, um, which of course is said by Sisa. <laughs> <laughs> Bringing it full circle. Um, so, from me and from the rest of Social Distance Book Fest, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you guys have enjoyed this panel. It's archived. Thank you for taking time out of your day to, to be here. And uh, the BookTube community will continue to do whatever we can to boost your voices, boost your books, and uh, help you in these trying times. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Uh, we're going to end it here. Enjoy the rest of your panels. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks, y'all. Thanks so much. Yeah.
Bye. Thank, Thank you so you. much. <laughs>